I've entitled today's message, Diet Faith. It'll mean more to you in just a moment. Diet Faith. All right, so it's Super Bowl Sunday. Uh, how many of you already have your favorite snacks waiting for you? Okay, so today's a day that calories don't count. Okay, they don't matter. It's one day out of the year that you can just, just go ahead and just indulge, right? How many of you have your uh, favorite sodas? Okay, uh, should I say beer? Keep your hand down. Uh, <laughs> like two hands went up. Okay. Uh, or, or whatever beverage of choice, right? Um, now, all of us kind of have a favorite soda. Let's be honest about this. How many of you have like a favorite, favorite soda? Raise your hand. Okay. Uh, for some of you, it's Coke, or for some of you, it's Sprite, or 7-Up, or, you know, Cherry Coke. For me, it's Dr. Pepper. Hands down, I, I just love Dr. Pepper. But don't go out and buy me any Dr. Peppers because uh, I don't drink them as much anymore. Maybe once a month, I'll, I'll splurge and have a Dr. Pepper. Uh, my new beverage of choice is sweet tea. <laughs> it's just as bad, uh, but, uh, you know, it just has natural tea and then a whole lot of sugar. Um, Really, sodas aren't the best for you, so you want to avoid them as, uh, as much as possible. Uh, you know, I'm thinking about these things, you know, dieting, because, you know, I'm now going to be 51 this month. And uh, so now you have to kind of rearrange, you know, how you eat and what you eat, simply because you can put on the pounds really fast, right? So I try to stay healthy, and I try to eat sensibly. And, and ch- I've never been on a diet, but I've altered my diet diet now that I've been getting older. And so what I would normally eat in the mornings, like three fried eggs with cheese and cereal and toast and on and on, I've now cut back way, I've had to cut way, way back uh, in my breakfast so that for dinner I could eat whatever I want, as much as I want. So, uh, (laughs) um, but people are really into diets, especially in the new year. You know, like, there are so many fad diets. I mean, think about the diet industry and, and just how incredibly, uh, how much money is brought in annually. It's a multi, multi, multi-million dollar industry, the diet industry. And it seems like there's a new diet fad coming out all of the time that people are trying to get you to buy into. Matter of fact, according to a recent article I just read on nutrition, they said eating right doesn't have to be complicated. So it got my attention. I thought, cool. And they went on to say, nutritionists say, there is a simple way to tell if you're eating right. Colors. If, if, if your plate is filled with bright colors, green, reds, and yellows, you know you're probably eating a nutritious meal. So this morning, I put that to practice. I had an entire bowl of M&Ms. Let me tell you something. <laughs> it was delicious. I, have, I never knew that eating right could be so fun, right? All right, let's go to Colossians 1, verses 11 through 20. Uh, it's an incredibly important section of Scripture. This is a blessing that Paul is bestowing on the church, which is on you and me today. Uh, it's a prayer. It's filled with some of the deepest theological concepts known to mankind. Here we go, Colossians 1:11. Strengthened with all might according to his glorious power for all patience and long suffering with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance. Say that with me the inheritance. So we're partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has delivered us. Say that with me. He has delivered us from the power of darkness, and conveyed us, or translated us, into the kingdom of the Son of His love, in whom we have redemption. Say that with me, redemption. Through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. Three key words we'll come back to in a little while. Inheritance, deliverance, redemption. Verse 15, He, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, For by him all things were created that are in heaven and are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things consist. He is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. In all things he may have the preeminence. Verse 19, 
For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell, and by him to reconcile all things to himself by him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. Let's pray. God, we thank you for this lengthy section of Scripture, and may the Holy Spirit filter the truth uh, that this section of Scripture is filled with into our minds and hearts today. May your word, may it be like it says in Scripture in the book of Ephesians, the washing of the water by the word. Thank you for your word washing our minds of all impure thoughts. Thank you for the word today washing our mind of all negative thoughts. Thank you for your word today, Lord, washing not only our minds but washing our hearts of impure motives and impure thoughts. Thank you for the cleansing power of your word by the work of your Holy Spirit today in every person's life. We thank you for that now in Jesus' name. Everyone said amen and amen. You know, speaking of uh, favorite sodas, I think uh, one of the favorite sodas of choice for Americans today is uh, the diet drinks, okay? Diet Coke. Uh, in particular, uh, Coke has, has really made a bundle of dough on uh, their new version of a diet soft drink called Coke Zero. Coke Zero. You know, it has zero sugar, zero calories, zero guilt. Uh, it's a knockoff of, of the original Coke, and the company actually claims that it is almost indistinguishable from the real thing. But there are no calories to count. There is no nutritional value to speak of whatsoever. It is just basically a can of chemicals. You know, it would be no different than opening up your kitchen sink, uh, the cabinets underneath your kitchen sink, pulling out your cleaning uh, uh, stuff uh, and, you know, pouring it into a, a cup and then dumping a bunch of sugar in it, stirring it up and drinking it down. I would not advise that to anybody in here, please. Kids, do not take Pastor literally in what he just said. That's my disclaimer. Uh, it's really just a can of chemicals that uh, fools your mind and your taste buds into thinking that you're actually drinking a Coke. I'm, I'm of the persuasion that if you're going to have a Coke, then have a Coke. Okay? Get, get the real stuff. 40 grams to 60 grams of sugar. And don't stop with just one can, okay? Take the whole six-pack, right? Because at the end of the day, you're basically drinking nothing. And I wonder sometimes if uh, we practice diet Christianity or diet faith. I, I wonder if we strip away uh, all of the, the, the sinew and the flesh and the bone and, and, and everything related to our faith, and we just basically approach Christianity, we approach our relationship with Jesus kind of as a sweetener to life. That when we're going through a difficult time, well, we really cling to the Lord and Graciously, as always, he pulls us through. But then when things begin to go uh, a little bit normal in our lives, then we're like, okay, I got it under control, Jesus. You know what? Go ahead and uh, get in the back seat or go ahead and stay in the house. You know, I'll take it from here. And then when we find ourselves in another, you know, uh, mini crisis or major crisis, once again, we go back to Jesus and we say, okay, Lord, we need you again. And I wonder sometimes if, uh, you know, like the diet industry, we just begin to have this, this uh, zero-calorie version of our faith. And all of a sudden, before we know it, you know, our faith does not have the potency, does not have the meaning, it does not have the power that it's supposed to have. We basically strip all the nutrients from our faith. Before we know it, we're kind of like pick and choosing, you know, uh, well, I like this section of Scripture, but I don't know about this section of Scripture. Or I like this teaching in the Bible, but I don't know about that teaching in the Bible. You know, the Bible predicted that the time would come when Christians would become selective in the type of messages that they would want, that they would like to hear. And, they, and, and the Bible uses the term that there would be a, uh, be a generation of those who have itching ears who want to be tickled, and they want messages that make them feel real good. You know, kind of like a jacuzzi Jesus. You know, everybody likes the jacuzzi, right? Because it just makes you feel really warm and comfortable all, all over. And if you're not careful, we begin to gravitate towards that. And we have this diet faith approach of our relationship with Christ, where we, uh, we want all the taste, but none of the calories. 
We begin to refuse the spiritual nutrients that we, that we need, that our lives need to be filled with so that we could be strong and vibrant and healthy uh, followers of Jesus. And so sometimes we have to take another look at our spiritual diet and ask ourselves, what have we been consuming? How healthy are we presently in, in, spiritually speaking? You know, in a world filled with God's love and his word and, and, and all the spiritual nutrients, we, we need to not just look spiritually fat, but really we're starving. We're starving for the deeper truths of, of God's word because that's what's going to feed us and that's what we are really hungering for. In other words, we begin to go after comfort over conviction or happiness without holiness or success without sacrifice or we want gain spiritual gain in our life without any pain you see some people want jesus to save their souls but leave their lifestyles alone and intact you see Many people in our world today, they, they love a Jesus that gets them out of hell, but they don't want a Jesus that gets hell out of them. Oh, that's good, isn't it? Oh, we don't simply want a Jesus that gets us out of hell, but a Jesus that gets the hell out of us. Yes, we want Jesus to have, as Paul said here in Colossians 1, preeminence in all things, because he really has it whether we let him have it or not. Preeminence. We are giving the Lord total access. What does that mean? To give the Lord total access. Well, you know, uh, at the ladies' conference that uh, just took place a week and a half ago, my wife invited me on uh, Friday night to come and be a part of a special meal with the guest speakers that were here and the guest musician and, 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 and some others, and it was going to be in the lower floor. She said, so show up at this time, and then text me when you're here because I have to give you an all-access badge. And I thought, oh, an all-access badge. She said, yes, with this badge, you can go anywhere on campus. And I thought, I am the senior pastor of Trinity Church. I have a 24-7 all-access pass. Thank you very much, okay? I'm not putting an all-access pass around my neck. Plus, I know the people work in security. They will vouch for me. So I got here, and I didn't get my all-access pass. And yes, I still made it all the way down to the lower floor and back to my vehicle, and I was not accosted by our security personnel, <laughs> which they wouldn't do anyway. They're good guys. Um, and I'm wondering if we give Jesus the all-access you know, badge where our lives are concerned. Now, I don't know about you, but I, I'll be honest about me. When I first surrendered my life to Christ, I did not initially give him all access to my entire life. How many of you, if you were honest, going to be honest, that you gave, you gave monthly installments of your life and your commitment to Christ? Uh, now, thank God for those of you that it happened all at once, okay? Maybe you should be up here today, and I should be out there, okay? But how many of you, 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 be, you slowly but surely begin to give Jesus all access to every area of your life, but it didn't happen all up front all at once? Come on, raise your hand, be honest. You're in church, you cannot lie. Okay. So I gave, I gave the Lord access to certain areas of my life, but then there were other areas of my life that I thought, no, these are off limit. You know, I, I, don't, I don't give this area up to anybody. I mean, nobody knows about th this part of my life. But the Lord in his love and in his patience and in his relentlessness, and in his, I'm Lord of all, or I'm not Lord at all, okay? He, he began, he, the Holy Spirit began to speak to me that I, began, I need to begin to yield these other areas of my life. I mean, let me just give you one quick example, okay? Uh, maybe some of you can't relate to this, but this is where I was at in my spiritual life way a long time ago, okay? In another century, literally, in another century. So uh, I love my rock and roll music. I loved my ACDC. I love Led Zeppelin. I love the cars. I love my music. And it was such a part of my life. It was actually a God. I mean, you know, you're not going to believe this, but I used to listen to Kiss when Kiss was very popular, okay? I guess we're trying to make a comeback now. I would go to sleep with an eight track 
Oh, young people, I lost you there. You're going to have to Google 8-track later on today and find out what in the world is he talking about. Uh, an 8-track, okay? And I'd stick it in my 8-track player, and I'd listen to Kiss all night long, and I'd wake up listening to it. Yes, I had spiritual problems. You could say that. <laughs> and so when I started my life to Christ, I thought, uh, there was no verse in the Bible that says, thou shalt not listen to hard rock, secular, uh, drinking, sex, uh, you know, uh, drugs, glorified music. There was no verse in the Bible that said that. So I was liter a literalist, and I thought, there shouldn't be a problem with this. But there was a problem. It was hindering my growth, and I couldn't figure out why I wasn't growing at the rate that I wanted to grow. I was trying to figure out why I began to have these guilty feelings, and it was the Holy Spirit in his love prompting me and convicting me that listening to that kind of music at that stage in my life was inconsistent with what God was wanting to do in my life at that time, and I had to give Jesus the full access badge in my life to allow him to come into that area of my life and clean up the stuff I was putting through these two ears and was going into my mind and settling down into my heart and when I surrendered that to him some of you have already heard this story before and when I surrendered that to him I said then what do I listen to and I started listening to country western music <laughs> and I wondered why I began to come to begin to uh, ponder thoughts you know of uh, of just ending my life and why I was so down and depressed and felt like I needed to drink beer 24 hours a day and then once again, the Holy Spirit, Jesus had full access, and I realized, wow, this is what I said, wow, God, you don't want me to listen to anything? Well, at that season in my life, I didn't need to be listening to that stuff, okay? And uh, lo and behold, way back when I found this station at the, at the far right end of the FM dial in Albuquerque, New Mexico, in New Mexico, called K-Light, and it was a Christian radio station. This, I'm talking 27, 28 years ago, okay? It was like one of the first in the country, and I jumped out of my skin. I couldn't believe there was Christian rock and roll. Oh, I, was, I was thrilled beyond belief, but I was reading after Keith Green and David Wilkerson back then, and they wrote article after article how Christian rock and roll was of the devil. Now, thank God for Keith Green and, and uh, David Wilkerson. They've both gone on to be with the Lord now, and they were great, 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 great men of God, and I respected them so much, I had a dilemma. Do I listen to them or not? And I chose not to because I enjoyed my music. It, it sung about, they, sang, they were singing about Jesus. And you're not taking this away, Lord, okay? You could have everything, but, but not this. Now, the point is that we want Jesus to have full access to every area of our life. You know, man, you know what that means? Jesus has full access to our forms of entertainment. Jesus has full access to the music we listen to, the magazines we read, the books that we read, the movies that we watch, the places that we go to. Jesus has full, because he has preeminence. He's, he's not Lord of all. He's not Lord at all. So we give him full access. Guys, that means that Jesus has full access to our marriages and what the Lord requires of us in service, the best interest, and in the service and the best interest of our family, of our wives, how we are to treat our wives, regardless of how our wives treat us. It's not about them. It's about our response, allowing Christ to have full access to every area of our life. And you know what? If we'll begin to treat our wives the way Christ treats us and wants us to treat our wives, lo and behold, how many of you know that they will begin to change? And the ladies are like, are you kidding me? Oh, I'm gonna, it's it's going to be your turn next, the ladies, okay? All right. <laughs> and ladies, if you will treat your husbands, give Christ full access to your life, and you'll begin to treat your husband the way Christ treats you and the way you uh, want to be treated and the way you deserve to be treated, you'll begin to treat your husband that way, all right? And you'll do it for no other reason than to honor God and to allow him to have full access to your life, and you'll begin to treat him with respect and honor. Whether he deserves it right now, presently, or not, you will begin to treat him that way. Lo and behold, something will happen. God will get a hold of his heart, and God will begin to do a work and begin to change him from the inside out. Well, I, 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 I've experienced... 
I'll give you another chance, but I have experienced more enthusiasm from a circus seal with arthritis, okay? <laughs> that was a great moment for all of us to give the Lord a hand. Can we do that now? All right, let's do it. All right, like you've done it before. Congratulations. So we don't simply want to be Christians that check off the saved box. See, 70, it used to be 91%, it keeps decreasing, down to about 71% of people uh, believe and profess faith in Christ. Uh, about 88% say that they believe in God. And I'm always reminded of James chapter 2, verse 19, which, where James says, you believe in God, great. But even the demons believe and they tremble. So what does our faith, what does our belief in Christ, what does it mean? Uh, Does it simply give us a free pass? Uh, Does it simply give us assurance uh, that that we are saved, and yet we don't allow Jesus to have full access to every aspect of our lives to begin to change things up? I remember uh, the the next uh, point that I needed to surrender over to Christ in my life was, uh, you know, I was in high school at that time, and it was the dating scene, okay? And, you know, uh, dating was an important part of, uh, of my life, and uh, really, from the time like I was a freshman until I was like a senior when I really turned my life over to Christ, I had never really gone a period of time without a girlfriend, <laughs> okay? So, uh, after I got saved, uh, the girls I knew were not good girls, let's say, okay? And they didn't love Jesus. And I thought that I could still maintain dating these non-believers, these non-Christians, and still allow Jesus to have full access to my life. And I I realized in in a very short period of time that wasn't going to work. And so I actually said, Jesus, are you saying? Because, you know, the Holy Spirit began to convict me. The Word began to speak to me. And then, you know, uh, I began to want to, to continue to allow Christ to have full access. And I thought, Lord, does this mean I am to be celibate the rest of my life? I literally thought that. And in my, in my um, sincere, and I, I had a lot of zeal and, and a little bit of knowledge, but in, in, in the sincere state that my heart was in, I literally thought, this is going to be hard, but okay. I'll, I'll, go, I'll go single, Lord, like Jesus and Paul. Now, thankfully, he had other plans, namely one Gloria Trujillo, okay? Um, thank the Lord. Uh, but I was so sincere. I was like, okay, God, if that's what it means, so be it. So what is it in your life? What area of your life today might the Holy Spirit, through his word, and it's not just because of today's message, but maybe for the last several weeks, maybe the last several months, maybe the last year, the Lord has been knocking on the door of your heart. He's been knocking on a door that has access to a particular area in your life that you're saying, "Mm, I don't know if I want to surrender that. Maybe it uh, has to deal with a grievance you have with somebody. Maybe it has to do with an offense. Maybe it has to do with unforgiveness. Maybe it has to do with a painful episode in your life that you have blocked off, you've boarded, you, you, you have barricaded, and you don't even want to have access to that place anymore. But until you allow the Lord to go in there and transform and change and renew and redeem that part of your life, you're going to continue to go through your Christian walk missing the best that God has for you. You see, Jesus isn't an additive. Jesus isn't a sweetener that simply enhances our otherwise intact lifestyles. No, Jesus is more than that. He's to have preeminence in all things. He's to be the priority of our life in all things. Yes, he sure does sweeten life, but he does so much more than that when we allow him to have complete and full and total access. Now, there were three words that I wanted you to make a a mental note of, three words that, you know, if you had your traditional Bible, you could highlight in your Bible. Or you can uh, take, if you're taking notes, you can take notes. Here are three words, three things I want us to look at in closing this morning. 
Three things that God has done for us. Three things that we need to realize where our lives are at today so that we can continue to grow and be healthy and whole spiritually. And the first is an inheritance. Look at verse 12 of Colossians 1. Once again, the Apostle Paul says, The Father has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance. Say inheritance. Of the saints. Christian child of God, or pre-Christians, those who are about to give their hearts to Jesus Christ. When you become a believer, you become an heir to an incredible inheritance. You know, a week and a half ago, I was in Albuquerque for my dad's funeral services, and because he served in the Korean War, which, for which I'm very proud, in, in the Army, he uh, was buried in the Santa Fe National Cemetery in Santa Fe. And so we went for the internment uh, there in Santa Fe, and, and it was a very uh, a special moment, special and moving moment, because uh, there's my father, I'm his son, he's now gone, and this is the first time in my life that somebody close to me has, has passed on. I've had friends and, and extended family members, grandparents, but it's different with a dad. And uh, after the, uh, the short words that were spoken there, we all left for a reception. And then the immediate family, my dad's wife, my stepsister, nephew, his wife, uh, we went back to the burial site. And by this time, his, his uh, casket had already been placed in the ground and the dirt had already been covered up and uh, they placed all the, the flowers around his burial plot. And I was doing pretty good up until that moment. Uh, then my, uh, uh, my, dad's, our, my family said, let's all grab hands and let's pray. And they said, Carl, why don't you say a prayer? And that's when I got all choked up, okay? Uh, it kind of hit me there. And we finished praying and we wiped the tears and we're like, okay, this is for real. This is the moment of truth. We got back in our cars and I drove back to Albuquerque and then eventually back here to Lubbock. And, and it felt as though I'm leaving a loved one behind. And I, I, I felt like a little bit of guilt. Like, and then realizing, well, that's just his body. you know, His soul is in heaven because he made profession of faith in Christ. And he trusted Jesus as his Lord and, and, and Savior. So I left, drove back to Albuquerque. I was staying at my mom's house. And I got back to my mom's house. And we began to kind of process the day. And it was a challenging day for her because, you know, um, she was my dad's second wife of 19 years, and then his most recent wife of 36 years was really the one that received all the honors at the end, uh, received the, the flag and, and a, uh, an expression of gratitude by that military personnel for his service to our country. Very moving, very powerful. So we were kind of talking process, and process. my mom asked me this question. She said, did your dad leave you anything? And up to that point, I never really thought about that. I never thought about an inheritance. I never thought about the fact that I am my dad's only child by birth, his only son. And I said, well, I guess not. <laughs> I mean, it's not like anybody said, you know, he wanted to make sure you had this, that, or the other. And, and it, that didn't matter. And as I thought on that, I said, you know, the greatest inheritance that my father left me was his name. When I gave the eulogy, uh, because it was a traditional Catholic uh, funeral, so they had what's called a rosary. Uh, his, his wife is, was ca is Catholic. And at the rosary, they allowed me to give the, uh, the eulogy. And uh, in, in my notes, I had written in there uh, that there's never been a time in my life that I was more proud to be called Carl Toady, because I'm junior and, and, he was, and he's senior. And I thought, you know, really, there are many types of inheritances that we, an inheritance we can receive, that we can be an heir of. And I think the one that we think most of is to be the heir of millions and millions of dollars, houses and, and cars and land and all of that. But at the end of the day, the most important inheritance that you and I could ever receive. Now, you know, thank God if you have a wealthy parent or grandparent or aunt or uncle or friend or whomever, and you know you are in their will. 
Now, what happens when you know you're in somebody's will and they have a lot? You're like, please hurry up and die. No, you shouldn't be that way, right? Uh, if you know you're in some wealthy person's will, right, and that when they die, you're going to be the heir to that, you live differently. You act differently. You, you, you have less stress in life because, you know, at some point in time, some, at some point in time, you know, you know, you know the, the windfall is going to come in. And really, that is biblical. The Bible says a righteous man leaves an inheritance for his children's children. So a godly man, when a godly man lives a godly life, he accumulates wealth. He shares it with God. He doesn't rob God in the accumulation of that wealth. We'll talk about that next weekend. But he accumulates wealth so that he could pass it on to his children's children. That the blessing of God on your life, the wealth that God has entrusted you with as a steward, it is to be transferred from one generation to the next generation. I was talking to one of our members in our church, and they were telling me that uh, they have stock options for their grandchildren. I said, not for your children? He said, no, for my grandchildren. I said, well, why your grandchildren? He said, because the Bible says a righteous man leaves an inheritance for his children's children. So I thought, there's some wisdom in that. And so it's very biblical to leave something so that uh, hopefully Glory and I live our lives by honoring God, putting Him first, uh, not robbing God from the tithe, which we've done our, our entire married life, and that we are wise stewards, that we live beneath our means, that as God blesses, we don't increase our lifestyle, uh, we increase our investments in the kingdom of God and in future posterity, and that prayerfully we will leave an inheritance to our children who then will take that, build that wealth, and leave an inheritance to their children and to their children and to their children. So, Jonathan, you better be nice to me because only you and your brother, right? So it's going to be split 50-50 unless you could end up with 60 and him 40 or vice versa. So just play nice. That's all I'm telling you, okay? <laughs> Imagine if you had a family member that actually hung that over your head. But when you know you have an inheritance, you think differently, you act differently, you live differently. But the greatest inheritance you can live, not houses or land or cars or jewelry or money or clothes, the greatest inheritance is a spiritual legacy. That's the responsibility of every parent, of every dad, and of every mom, of every grandparent or grandma to be, of every single person who will one day be a husband and then a father and then a grandfather, for every single woman who will one day be a wife and then a mother and then a grandmother. That's how we have to think, young people. That's how you have to think, not just the momentary, instantaneous gratification and pleasure that you can derive from that relationship, but when you're about to make a lifelong commitment with this person, you need to ask yourself this question, will he be a good father? Will he be a good grandfather? And if you cannot unequivocally say to yourself, yes, he will be a good father, yes, he will be a good grandfather, then you need to dump him as quickly as possible and continue your search until you find the right one. Because we have to think of an inheritance that we are going to leave behind. And think about it, child of God, you have received an inheritance in Christ. And what have we, what are we heirs to? Titus 3, 7, we're heirs of eternal life. Hebrews 1, 14, we're heirs of salvation. And in Galatians 3, 29 and Romans 4, 14, we are heirs to the promise made to Abraham. We are heirs right now. You, as you live and breathe and are seated in this place today, you are an heir of God. You are a joint heir of Jesus Christ. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, and what's his is yours and mine, not just for 60 years or 70 years or 80 years, but for all of eternity, we will inherit our Father's kingdom. Can we thank God for that inheritance? Amen. The second thing, the second word is deliverance. Colossians 1.13, it says, He has delivered us from the power of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of His Son, a Son of His love. You know, darkness is powerful. Now, light is a force, but darkness isn't in science. But spiritually speaking, my friend, darkness is a force, and it is a power. I don't know if you saw in the news lately, but an AP story, and it's, a, it's not an urban legend, it's a, a verifiable, legitimate news story of a house, I think somewhere in Indiana, that has been haunted. 
and some of the creepiest, spookiest stuff has been going on inside of that house. Just want to let you know, I don't watch horror shows, okay? I don't watch scary shows. When I was a kid, I used to watch scary shows. I don't watch scary shows anymore because I know that stuff is real. I know the devil's power is real, but I'm thankful that God's power is more real, amen? Uh, the devil has power, but God has all power, amen? So I just don't, I don't mess with that stuff. Now, I cast demons out. I've gone over, I'm going to say this now, I'm going to get all kinds of phone calls. I've gone over to people's houses, and, I've, and I've, I've cast demons out of people's homes. I do not do that anymore. I do not have time to do that anymore. But if you know somebody that has a haunted house, we'll send some spirit-filled people over there who know, to, who know how to speak the power of God, and we'll get that, that ghost out of your house, okay? I know you're looking at me like, what? That's, this stuff is real. Demon possession is real. There are a lot of people in our world today that are living under the power of darkness. It is its own dominion, its own place that holds people in bondage. I know of that which I speak because there was a time in my life that I lived under the power and dominion of the spirit uh, of darkness in my life, and it was real. The darkness that was over my life and my life was bound by was real. I knew it was real, and I needed help, and only God could help me. When I was back in Albuquerque, I drove by our old home, the very first home we bought, 7316 Bangor Avenue Northwest, uh, right at the foothills of the Petra Cliff on the west side of Albuquerque there uh, in the city of Albuquerque. And I drove by this, our old house, and that's where my sons were born and raised for a few years. And that was our starter home. It was 1,190 square feet, three bedroom. My wife and I, uh, it was a foreclosure home that we got for $63,000. As soon as we signed the papers and moved in, it was worth $83,000 because we were tithers. God blessed us supernaturally. We could barely afford $63,000 home. We barely got in, barely qualified, but instantaneously we had $20,000 in equity. And it was a beautiful little home. I drove by there, I stopped my vehicle, and I was looking at the house. And it had the same paint that we had painted it with like 15 years ago. <laughs> It, and nothing's changed. I couldn't believe it. I thought I'd look in the backyard and see my dog, too. You know, I'm like, wow, haven't you done anything since we've left? <laughs> uh, uh, you might know that person. Please uh, take that off the tape. Um, I say things jokingly. Like I get all kinds of emails and stuff. Um, so I thought, you know, well, we used to live there, and there's a lot of good memories. But we used to live there, right? I thought momentarily, should I go up to the front door, knock, and just introduce myself, say, I was the, I was the for, former owner. Can I come in, just check things around? I like to go in the back bedroom, just kind of sit there and reminisce about, you know, uh, all the beautiful things that, that happened in this home. That would, not, that would be weird, right? I, I did not do that. I, I thought of it, but I did not do that because it's not my home anymore. I don't live there anymore. You see, your old life, the life you used to live, that's not you. God has translated you. The word translate means to, to move from one place to another forcibly. God has moved you and changed your address. Now you live at a new domain in a new kingdom with a new king. And just as real as the power of darkness is, the power of the light of his kingdom and his righteousness is that much more powerful in your life and in my life. And when the devil wants to take you back to your old life, you say, yeah, that's where I used to live, devil, uh, with you. You were my roommate, but not any longer. I have changed locations. I have moved to a new address. I live under a new king, and I am part of an eternal kingdom. I have been delivered. Say, I've been delivered. You see, that's what many people need today, the deliverance. They don't need coaching or counseling or therapy as much as they need deliverance. And only God can offer that through the power of his son, Jesus Christ. And finally, the word forgiveness. Colossians 1.14, it says, In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. Now, as I finish on this last point, some of you have been wondering, I know, you've been wondering, we didn't take up the offering. And I know you've been itching to give in the offering. Matter of fact, I have not had your full undivided attention the last 35 minutes because you're like, I want to give my offering. I'm with you. So go ahead and get it ready. We didn't forget. It's a snow day. People come late. We want to make sure if they miss anything, they don't miss giving to God. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, we're going to do this next week also. We actually planned it for this week because it fit the message. But anyway, you don't need to know all that. 
Just get your offerings ready, your tithes, your commitments to the yard. And as you prepare to honor the Lord with your giving, the last word here, there's inheritance, deliverance, is the word forgiveness that I want to leave you with. We can't casually read these words or even read this entire text, and there's so much in it, we don't have time to go through everything. But three words I wanted to bring to our attention to make sure that we don't have a fad Christianity, a diet faith Christianity. And that's the word forgiveness. You know what the word forgiveness means? It means this, to send off, to send away, to release, to let go. It gives the image of what occurred in the Old Testament with an animal called the scapegoat. Once a year on the Day of Atonement, the high priest would take two goats. One goat, they'd slit the throat, and the blood would be used for atonement. The other goat, they would take, and they would place their hands on this goat, and they would transfer all the sins of the nation of Israel upon this goat, and then they would release the goat into the wilderness. They would let it go. They would send it off, never to return again. And it spoke of Christ being our scapegoat, that not only did he voluntarily shed his blood for the redemption of our sins so that we could know his forgiveness, but he was sent away as our substitute. And our sins were sent away with him, never to be found again. As far as the east is from the west, to the depths of the sea, never to be recovered again. Our sins have been cast from us. They have been released. They, we have let them go. Now, the problem is, the problem is, we go looking for that goat. Here, goat, here, goat. Here, goat. I can't even whistle. <laughs> hey, goat, where are you? Hey, goat, come on back. And we bring that goat back into our life when God says, no, you've released it, let it go, and don't ever let it come back again. And don't go looking for that goat, okay? You know, it comes to our sins that we've committed. When we give them over to God, they are released, they are taken, they are forgiven, and by God's grace, where he's concerned, they are forgotten. Why can't you forget about them? Why can't we release them? And when it comes to the sins of others, we need to send them off. Not the person, the sin, okay? I have some people I like to send off, you know. No, we need to release those sins, let those sins go, and quit allowing that goat to take up precious space in our lives. Forgive and let go. It's not a matter of whether they deserve it or not. Many times people don't deserve it. Many times they don't even want your forgiveness. But you must release that from your life so that you allow Jesus to have full access to every part and every aspect of your life so that you don't damage your own soul and the future blessing that God wants to bring into your life because you're holding on to an offense or you're holding on to unforgiveness. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Father, we thank you. That right now we're going to begin to live as though we are heirs of a great inheritance because we are. Thank you for the delivering power of Jesus in our lives, setting us free from the power of darkness, changing our address, translating us into a brand new kingdom of your dear son. And thank you, God, for the forgiveness that we have received by the redemption of Christ on the cross of Calvary and his shed blood. We can know forgiveness. We can live a shame-free and guilt-free life. We can live without regrets because we don't look in our past. When we do, the blood of Jesus has washed it away. We look in faith to the future of who God is, is, is creating us to be in his son, Jesus Christ.